right, this is Spencer from The Ron Staple. I'm here with Megan McCarthy. Uh, she is, as you know, a writer from, she was a writer in season one and two, wrote episodes like Party One, Lesson Zero, and Kent Lot Wedding, the season finale, season two. And you are now the story editor for season three. Um, and I'm here to interview her to ask her a couple questions. Uh, so, uh, first off, you know, how your new job is the story editor for season three. Uh, how have you been adjusting to that role as an editor? You know, like, what are the kind of challenges that you have to deal with now compared to, like, when you had to write for season three? Is it, you know, more challenging? Um, it's different challenges. Um, I was a freelancer on the first two episodes, so I would only come in when it was time for me to write a story and work with Lauren and Rob. And now, um, part of my job is sort of management. It's uh, assigning the premises to the different writers and then making sure that they turn them in in a somewhat timely <laughs> manner. Um, so it's a lot of sending emails like, hey, what's the ETA on that one? <laughs> um, but um, uh, similar challenges in that it's, it's taking stories and, and helping the writers uh, break those stories and, uh, and then deliver a, a script at, at the end. Um, so same process as far as there's a room where I meet with the writer who's assigned that particular uh, script and uh, and break the story in the same way that I did when I was working on my own in yeah. the first two seasons. I just get to call the shots a little bit <laughs> more than this time before. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have the last say in, in this case. I guess. Um, have you ever done like something like an editor editing job before? You know, where you get to overlook and manage it. Like I did. I was uh, the, sort of the showrunner on a show called Class of Three Thousand, which was Andre Benjamin from Outcast. Okay. Uh, Short-lived. So, so, so you think you're ready and, for this position? Uh, yeah. So I had done it before, and, and actually on that show, I was even more involved in um, in working with the voice actors and looking at the storyboards and things like that. Here, my work is mostly done once the script is locked, and then it goes off to someone else. Mm -hmm. to take care of from there. Okay. Uh, so how did you get, how did you actually get pulled into the show in the first place? And, you know, what were your, like, when you first got pulled into the show, what, what were you expecting the show's reaction to be? You know, like, obviously you didn't think it was going to be, like, super big. Oh, no, I totally predicted this. I'm the, oh. only, I'm the only one that did. So you have future sight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but, like, as a show for, like, you know, pro you probably made the show for, you know, the age audience for little girls. And, you know, how did you think the your reaction would be, be for them? Uh, well, I had worked with Lauren before on Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, so that's how I knew her and how she knew my work to, to bring me onto the show. So that's kind of how I got involved. And um, I knew it would be good because she's super talented and cared so deeply about making it really good. And it was really important to her that there be a show, um, at the time she was thinking for, for girls, um, that had really strong stories and really strong characters and, and, um, and really meant something. So that was her primary goal and that was m my goal when I came in to write the episodes was to deliver what she expected and what I expected um, of myself as, as far as quality and good storytelling. Um, and then I think all of us were obviously pretty shocked when a different demographic responded <laughs> to it. Um, but that didn't change how we approached the show because we were always coming from a place of of having these great characters and, and telling interesting stories with them, and that is going to appeal to a broad audience, as we've obviously discovered. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very interesting. Uh, now, can you, like, when you are write, when you were writing for season one, season two, like, can you tell us about, like, any guidelines that you had when you were, you because you were given a story from, like, Lauren Faust yeah. um, to, like, hey, write this premise out. Were you given any guidelines about what to do in the episode in terms of like your creativeness like did you get a rule about how many pop culture references you could do or is there any limit on like um can you have this much technology in the episode you know like no, how I much mean, freedom were you given there's rules within just the world of how yeah, it's like, set up yeah. um that you can and can't do certain things because you know there's not gonna be robots exploding things because <laughs> that's not the show mm -hmm. um but other than that there weren't any rules beyond just the regular sort of there needs to be three acts and act breaks and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, but otherwise, it was pretty much free to, to do what you want. I mean, we would break the stories in pretty good detail in the in the room with Lauren and, and with Rob, or just just with Rob if Lauren wasn't available. So we had every scene basically mapped out. Um, but it would just be, you know, 
Fluttershy goes and yells at the dragon, or whatever. It would be something very simple, and then I would have to, to flesh it out. Um, so the process is sort of like they give you the premise, and you know that you guys start laying out the scenes, and then you put in you know all the lines for the scenes. Yeah, there'd be no cards basically. That would be this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. It would just be what the characters are going to do, what's going to move the story forward, mm -hmm. and then I would take those home in a big old stack and hope to not get them out of order <laughs> on the way home. And then I would take those and, and write out the individual scenes and, and the dialogue and the jokes that would be within those. Sometimes we would pitch jokes in the room or dialogue in the room, and sometimes we wouldn't. Sometimes it would be very just a very loose, uh, here's what happens in the scene, go for it. Because you guys are given a good amount of creative freedom, like you've said multiple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah to just, I mean, I, I think for me was when I was a uh, writing party of one, and it was the scene where she's talking to all the inanimate objects. And, <laughs> and that was just me like, what are the things that she's talking to? A bag of wits, and rocks, you know, just pulling stuff out of the, you know, out of the air to, to put down that I thought was, would be funny. Um, and was uh, pleasantly surprised that they said, yes, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised, like you probably don't get much turned down, I bet, you know? I mean, there's notes, there's always notes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, 99% of the time, I'm like, yep, you're right, I should, that's what we should do, or, or that would make more sense, or, um, because you get so close to the material, sometimes you can't, you can't see things that uh, right. fresh eyes will, will notice, you know, this isn't quite working, or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's always, there's always, you're always going to get, get feedback, but. Okay. And, okay, so for, um, the writing of the show, like, I'm going to talk about the communication with Hasbro, like, and kind of relating to what we were talking about, the freedom that you guys have as writers, like, I don't know, like, how often do you guys actually talk with Hasbro, like, in terms of, like, getting concepts down, like, uh, you're pro I don't know if you're there for when the story, initial story concepts are down for the show, but, like, um, if Hasbro wanted to, like, call into you guys and say, like, hey, we need this in this episode, or we need this in the show, like, is it, like, are they really flexible, is it something you guys can, like, you know, have sort of a back and forth. Well, like, is it really regular? Is it free? Or is it kind of like they just lay down a mandate at one time? No, it's, it's very, it's an open communication of, I mean, of what everybody wants to see happen on the show. And there's back and forth and, and discussion about things. So I haven't felt like, do this or, you know, I, it's, it's pretty, I get to tell a lot of really great stories that I want to get to tell. And do you, how often do you think Hasbro actually enter, even gets into what you guys even work on? Uh, I mean, the, I know everybody sees everything, so. Oh. I, I, but beyond that, I. But I, I mean, how often do they contact you guys and be like, hey, we need you guys to like change this or put this in? Like, uh, it's, you know, we just get notes on, on the script. You know, we turn in the scripts and probably then we pretty get. Regularly. No, yeah, every time you turn it in, I mean, somebody. Somebody gives you, oh, okay. give you, gives you feedback. Uh, that's just the process on any show, anywhere, yeah. um, that you're going to get uh, get get notes from, from people on various, various things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And now for the concepts of episodes, um, like I think we've heard before, at least for season two this was how it was, where um, Lauren Faust and a bunch of the other writers would like sit down mm -hmm. you know, in a room or a conference and you know, just throw out a bunch of concepts for episodes, like this is what we're going to do for season two. Now, um, I don't know if there's like, usually within the shows so far, there's kind of been a difference between like the adventure, epic mm -hmm. stuff, and you know, those slice of life kind of episodes. Like, were, I don't know if you can even say anything about this, but mm -hmm. were there any like, pull, were there people like arguing, or was there any like pull for like, hey, let's do more epic stuff, or can we do more Not slice of really. life? It kind of, it's, it kind of happens very organically where when we're breaking stories or we'll have a, a writer's summit and I'll, you know, we'll say, everybody bring in five just springboards that we can all just kind of riff on in the room. And it kind of happens organically where you'll have one or two of these more epic adventures kind of come to the forefront and then these other character uh, sort of things. So there's not like a plan. It's not like, and then we will do two of these and then there'll be three of these and then there'll be two. And it's, no one's arguing about it. No, no, no. It just, it just kind of happens and, and if the story's good, then it, it goes. And if it doesn't, then we, we talk it out. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's, it's, not a, there's not a formula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys are just very. Or if there is, yeah. no one's told it to me. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you guys are very arguing very much either, too. So that's no, good. no, it's it's good. I mean, obviously, there's you know within the room there'll be back and forth and discussion, and people will be like, I'm not sure if that's working. I'm not sure if this is working. And and but it's that part of part of being a writer's room is being able to let stuff go and just say, uh, oh, I like that idea, but you guys don't like it. Fine, let's let's move on. Yeah, because I, I know you guys don't write like together. Like all the writers pretty much yeah. do their own thing, yeah. so you know. 
It's yeah. just interesting, what, what do you guys do when you're together? Um, make a lot of jokes <laughs> and um, ask when lunch will be there. <laughs> just like today. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, now focusing on the story editor and your position again. Now, um, Lauren, when she when Lauren Faust originally created this show, she, like, what she pretty much does, like any show, I think, like, um, I think she tries to go for her, her expression of feminism, of making a good show for little girls. Mm -hmm. And as a story editor now, do you see yourself as, like, a guardian of that vision? Like, how do you think you work on, do you still, like, try and work to keep that in as absolutely, a story editor? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she uh, started something that um, I had so much respect for her and so much respect for what she created that I'm not going to be like, it's mine and I'm going to do whatever, it's going to be mine. No. Um, because I think that's why it's been so successful is because of, of the type of stories and um, the vision that she had from it. Uh, for it from the start and that's I just want to continue down that down that path yeah and, and you guys and do you guys actually see yourself as like this is actually working as a good show that little girls can like actually watch because that's what it's supposed to be and I think and yeah I mean that's that's who um, I have a daughter and I she loves the show and I want her to continue to think her mom's a good cool. test audience <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so I'll show her episodes and be like what do you think about this one um, so yeah, you know, from having a daughter and being a woman, that I appreciate the fact that this is a, a really quality show for that demographic, and um, and it's awesome that other people are are drawn to it um, as well. But I don't sit there and think, you know, what is my audience going to think? You know, I'm thinking, what is this character doing? What what's going to move this story forward? And if I start to try to write specifically for the audience or think of the audience I'm not in the mind of the character and that's whose brain I need to be in as I'm, as I'm telling stories. Okay, so you, it just, the writing just comes naturally, you're not actually targeting, you're not, you're basically not even like thinking about making like a kid show, you're just doing what you want I to. I just want to, yeah, to me it's, it's, if I were any, if I were working on any other show I would approach it exactly the same, mm -hmm. the same way. Okay. Um, with the same, the same sort of rules of, of, of writing and, and of, you know, the, the bar that I try to set for myself. It's you know it doesn't it, I would have the same whatever on. on well, the show. quality of the show is pretty high. You know? <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> his opinion you. will tell you. <laughs> um, now, when you working mm -hmm. on when you were writing on stro I like you I guess you I don't know if you still do freelance work for other shows, but uh, well, <laughs> probably not at the moment. But you know what? Like when you're working as a writer, like what are the kind of stories that you like to write on? You know, and like what are the kind of stories that like you really excited to do, or are there any kind of stories where you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that, can someone else do it? I, I mean, I usually try to find my way into a story in a way that keeps it interesting for me, because <laughs> I don't want to be like, eh, I'm halfway through. Yes, at least be good for you. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm the first, you know, audience member or whatever. Um, but I guess I've had sort of a trend on this show of, of the characters going a little bit um, crazy. Yeah. And I think that's a, a it's an odd theme in my writing is a, is a lot of times take is finding a character finding their way back to the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I've seemed to hit that theme a lot where I, I, I like to see someone kind of go to an extreme and then they have to, you know, they don't go all the way back th this way. They have to find their, their way of like being centered. I think you did it for Twilight like twice. You know, you did Lesson Zero <laughs> and Carol, you know, Carol Wedding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, you really I like to portray her as crazy. Yeah, <laughs> well, I like to put Tara through the ringer. It's really what it is. I like to make her stretch a little She bit. enjoys it. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, so now I was going to ask about the lyric writing for the show. Because um, you've run a number, a certain number of episodes you've written have songs in them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the writer, you guys are the ones who write the lyrics for yeah. any of the songs. Mm -hmm. Now, um, for the Kennelot Wedding, uh, you, the, you know, one of the most popular ones is this day aria. Um, a lot of people are really impressed by that song just because of you know some of the stuff you did is like people are like, oh man, this is like Disney, you know, like they're really impressed by the amount of stuff you guys do with the lyrics, and like we want to ask like, are you guys musically inclined? Have you actually had any experience with writing lyrics or anything? Um, or? I was in a really rocking band when I was in high school. Really? So, no. oh. I mean, I was in a band, but we <laughs> we rocked moderately. I but you weren't. So but you I were was in a band. band. Okay. But I think that yeah, I'm like secretly I. Would that's what I Actually, what you what you playing the plane? Where you? I, I can play a little bit of guitar. I'm a better guitar player than I get myself credit for, but I sang, um, and wrote um, wrote the songs, okay. wrote the lyrics. Um, so I think part of me, um, 
you know, that's what I w would like to be when I grow up as a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a lot more, maybe it would be a little more glamorous than yeah. you know, being a writer. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, but so I just like writing, writing the songs. But I was talking about this on the panel, that I don't hear um, the music um, in my head. Right. To me, it's more like writing a poem. Um, and so there's a rhythm to the song to me, and, and just also what I'm trying to convey story-wise. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of what my process is. And I think every writer probably has a different process, and, and uh, different writers on the show love to write songs, and other people are like, oh, I don't really, you know, that's not my thing. Yeah. So it just kind of depends on that. <laughs> I guess it's interesting because Emmy Keen Rogers, she, I mean, we've all heard about her original plans for a small song, like, yeah. how often do the lyrics actually change when, do you guys, when you guys write them out? Is that just I like a one-time thing? Like or like mine have changed significantly just because I do try to, to make a, a very concerted effort to, to have that rhythm that that Daniel can I identify so he can build the, the music and, and I think that rhythm is probably and, most identifiable in, you know, the, the day Haria, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was very like, this is this is how this needs to, to play out so that he could read it and know, like, boom, you know. Um, as he it's, it's, he says, it, that your song Scan is what he's told me. That, <laughs> that he's not like, how am I going to fit this into a verse? These syllables are all over, you know, the number it's of syllables job, are all over the place. So, um, which I didn't know I, I was doing. It just kind of made sense to me that I'm thinking of it as a, as a poem. So, Comes naturally. So, I guess so. <laughs> and New York and stuff. And uh, so, what was the song you think uh, was most difficult to write? Uh, so I far? think that this day aria because it it was it was this back and forth, and I wanted to parallel lyrically uh, what was going on with Caden with both cadences. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> I assume anyone who's watching yeah, this is probably, probably gonna have already has, seen it. Has seen it, but um, but that was definitely the most most uh, most challenging um, for me, and I. I remember being up very, very late in my office <laughs> and, and trying to make that work. And, and um, But it's, I think it's one of my proudest things. And then just when I heard what Daniel ha did to it musically, I was just like, this thing is going to just be unbelievable. And then when I saw the animation with it, it just... And, every, and everyone loves it, you know. Yeah, and yeah, and that it got a, got a great response. So, you know, I think the most like interesting thing about it is just that how, how did you decide to make it like it's common to have like you know a villain has a song and then you know play it off with the hero but you do that within the same song like was that just what you wanted to do you yeah know? i just thought it would be uh you know i thought it would be fun and i think just you have a an imposter <laughs> and uh and and to to play them back and forth it's the same person but with different agendas mm -hmm. um was just interesting yeah to me. Um, actually, speaking of Carolot Wayne, like I heard that from the staff, like you guys enjoy working on like the big episodes, like you know, the two parters, you know. It's 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 a, it's fun when you have a big story to tell because you feel like you have the, the freedom to to really tell that big story and really explore a lot. Um, it's it's interesting because sometimes with a twenty two minute or even within an act, a seven minute act, sometimes this sometimes seven minutes feels like, oh my god, how am I going to fill this? this seven minutes and other times you're like there's no I have too much there's too much I can't possibly <laughs> cram it all into there it's, it's such a weird thing depending on on the story mm -hmm. um, but you can usually tell when it's something like the wedding that it, it needed to be big mm -hmm. sometimes some people want it to be even bigger <laughs> you know I mean people keep asking you about a movie and you know no one knows about that but we'd all enjoy it I'm sure yeah I'm saying yeah <laughs> <laughs> who knows um so for um other than, like, you know, well, okay, this is going to be asking about creative outlets. Like, when, what are your, your inspirations, like, for crafting the story, um, other than, like, maybe writing? Like, where do you get your inspirations from when you, like, like, basically, like, what drives you when you like, <coughs> write a story? Is it, like, any inspiration? Um, I never know where it's going to come from, and I always say that, Every time I start, it's as if I have never written anything before. <laughs> <laughs> that first, that blank page, it really is. It's like, have you done this? When? How did you ever come up with stuff? And then it just kind of happens. It's such a, uh, yeah, it's hard to ex to explain where ideas come from. They just kind of do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, yeah, I, I don't know. 
<laughs> I mean, if you clean the slate, I would, I would go there more often. If you clean the slate every time, they may explain why you keep going back to the crazy. Yeah, really. I'm yeah. like, that worked. I'll do that again. How am I going to make so-and-so? Well, it's more like you're just like, oh, wait, this is a good idea doing this crazy thing, even though you don't realize you've already done it before. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's a good idea. So why don't you do that? Yeah, but this guy, plug in. Yeah, just find and replace with some of the different kind of <laughs> If you could, this is a hypothetical question, okay. kind of weird, um, but if you could have like any writer, from, like any time, or if you had an unlimited budget, just for fun, like who would you want to have write on, you know, My Little Pony, show. just for like, you know, just to see what would happen. Oh my gosh. Um, oh, that's good. Uh, that's a Coen Brothers? <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know. Um, that would be kind of interesting to see. Mm -hmm to see what they would come up with. And also just like so I could hang out in the room. <laughs> so, That's a perfectly good reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and just a last note, you know, it, besides MLP, like are you working on anything else? Or is there any other show you want to plug? Or? Uh, no, it is, yeah, no. Probably because you're story editor and you're busy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty busy. All right, well, thank you for joining you're us. You're very welcome. Thanks mm -hmm. for having me.